Hello, and thanks for joining us for the Friends of the Farm lecture series. Each session is designed to deliver a small and in-depth dose of cannabis education. I'm Candace Hawes, and I want to thank all of our viewers and all of our customers from the pharmacy, from the pottery, from the Naturally Healing Center, and from locations all around the world where you're finding us online. Today is International Women's Day, and we're, talk and we're talking about strong women in the cannabis industry. And I'm really proud to host our special guest speaker today, Julia Jacobson, who's the co-founder of Aster Farms and a positive and in influential force in the community. Aster Farms, if you're not already aware of their great brand, is a women-owned sustainable cannabis cultivator located in Northern California. They're committed to cultivating high-quality cannabis products while also prioritizing sustainability and social responsibility. It's their commitment to regenerative farming practices and giving back to the community that set them apart from the whole cannabis industry. Aster Farms offers a range of cannabis strains and products, including flowers, pre-rolls, and concentrates. This company's strains are carefully cultivated to ensure the highest quality and are tested for potency and purity. And I want to just say a little bit about our speaker today, Julia Jacobson, who's the CEO of Aster Farms. Julia founded Aster Farms when the cannabis plant helped her regain her life after a decade-long battle with chronic uh, migraines, which a lot of us deal with. Prior to Aster Farms, Julia was the buyer for Bloomingdale's, giving her a solid foundation in retail supply chain economics. She then moved on and was the co-founder and CEO of NMRKT, an affiliate marketing platform for, for content providers. She led the company through the tech starts and its acquisition by Exo Group in 2016, where she went on to be the director of national revenue products. As an exited CEO, she brings expertise in entrepreneurship and business development to the Aster Farms team. Julie, Le Julia leads the company's high-level vision, has successfully raised funding in a capital-constrained industry, and has taken the brand national starting with the NY expansion. Julie has become a, a thought leader in the cannabis and uh, sustainability space and has spoken on panels including South by Southwest, PBC, Trailblazers, She Can, Females to the Front, and Weed Week. Today, she continues to be a mentor to young entrepreneurs in the field. She's been featured in the Economist, Gossamer, Centennial Women of Weed, Forbes, Dope Magazine, High Times, Marijuana Venture, and Muse by Clea and Clear One More. So we're really glad to have her with us today. And before we actually get to the questions that I have prepared, I want to show a video that was really well done and put on by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. So we're going to go ahead and begin with that video first. At Aster Farms, we're growing cannabis the right way, through regenerative agricultural practices, growing outdoors in living soil under the sun, moon, and stars. People would be surprised to know how difficult it actually is to grow cannabis. Unlike other agricultural crops, it really is a plant-intensive crop where you're paying attention to each individual plant. It's not a crop that needs to be grown on large scale. You can grow an acre and have a really viable business. And therefore, it's a crop that's able to be grown in the best environmental and agricultural practices. We don't just grow outdoors. A lot of farms grow outdoors, but in pots. We are growing right in the ground in living soil, which means that we are actually putting time and energy into creating a living ecosystem in our soil that's feeding our plants. In doing that, we are also really paying attention to all of the inputs and outputs that are going into that soil, including water. We have a 400,000 gallon ag pond that we're using as a rain catchment system. Over the winter months, even in the drought, we're able to fill that pond at least three quarters of the way. Additionally, by covering all of our soil with straw mulch, we are able to help ab absorb more of that water that we're putting in and, and stop it from evaporating. There's a big difference between what we consider craft cannabis and corporate cannabis. At Aster Farms, we call them plant factories. Cannabis is a very valuable per square foot crop, and I don't mean that on a monetary sense, but in terms of what the actual output is. Unlike corn, you don't have to grow thousands of acres to have a viable crop. So when it comes to the way that cannabis should be grown, each plant should have care and attention, and it should be grown in a way that you are not wasting resources. 
For us, the reason that we grow this way is we believe that this creates the best possible product. When you're growing craft product, you are creating a product that has a complex cannabinoid profile, that has dense and really rich terpenes, and that creates a consumer experience and a high, if you will, that's what people always want from cannabis. Lake County is a fantastic place to grow cannabis and is little known in the cannabis industry or for people in general for a few reasons. There's a strong diurnal cycle, which is the difference between the temperatures at night and the temperatures during the day. And this helps condense the buds, the flavor and the profile. So it gives a better cannabinoid and terpene profile to the, the product, just like it does with wine. Another reason is it's high and dry. We are in a higher and drier location than Mendocino and Humboldt and some of the um, more mid-coastal regions. So that helps us avoid mildew. It gives us a longer season, so we're able to grow more sativas in Lake County. And the third reason is we have beautiful airflow here. We have had to overcome many challenges, including the farm being burned down in the 2018 Mendocino complex fire. It's also difficult because of the drought that we're dealing with in California. On a regular basis, we are always worried and, and constantly watching our water, watching the levels in our well and making sure that we're being as efficient as possible with our catchment and you know pulling in of water and also our output. Going through that is really the resilience that you need in being part of this industry in general. The cannabis industry is a nascent industry and it takes a lot of resilience. It takes the courage and the dedication and the motivation to literally rake yourself out of the ashes and keep going. I would tell somebody entering the regulatory industry in California that you really need to do it the way that this plant was always meant to be grown. It's important to be carrying on a legacy in cannabis that is doing right by the environment, that's doing right by consumers, and that's doing right by the genetics that we've all inherited. It's been very rewarding to have conviction about the way that you want to grow, believing that growing in living soil using these regenerative practices really does produce the best quality cannabis, and then to hear from your consumers that they had that radiant experience, that they love your cannabis because it gave them the medicinal effects that they're looking for, that they enjoyed their experience, they connected with their world, they were engaged. And so that's probably the most rewarding thing to hear is that the idea and ideals that we put behind this have actually come to fruition with the people consuming our products. Well, that was awesome. I love that video. I already loved your guys' product and your uh, your farm, but being able to see it and like kind of learn a little bit more, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. And I hope everybody enjoyed that as well. <laughs> Hello, Julia. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for sharing that video as well. It was really fun to have Fish and Wildlife with us and fun to be here with you and with the whole community today. Yeah, that's really neat that you guys were able to be spotlighted and they're going to use you guys as like an educational resource, like for other people to teach them about the cannabis industry and the sustainability um, measures that we're taking. So that's really cool. What an honor to work with them. And that was a great piece. So great way to start our, our webinar here today and happy International Women's Day. You too. And to everyone else following. Wonderful. All right. Well, let's get into it. So um, can you start by telling us a little bit about your background, what you did before the cannabis space, and then like what brought you here after working in the corporate world? Absolutely. So I started my career as a buyer for Bloomingdale's um, in New York and um, transitioned from there when I saw a, an opportunity, a hole in the market where um, things were not being efficient enough. There was a big opportunity to change. And so I started my first company, my first startup, and uh, attempted to fix the problems that I saw in the industry. 
I ran that company for about five and a half years. And as you mentioned, went through Techstars and was ultimately acquired. And, um, you know, that got me deep into the tech industry. And I'm not blaming the tech industry on my migraines. They are hereditary and they were coming no matter what. Um, but I certainly really got to the depths of um, the worst part of my chronic migraines at that time in my career. It was completely debilitating. It was holding me back from participating in my career, participating in my family life, participating in my social life, just being part of my own life. Um, I was ending up in the hospital on a regular basis, was on a cocktail of pharmaceutical medications. And one time in the in the hospital, um, the ER doctor said to me, if you have access to cannabis and you feel comfortable with it, I recommend you try it for your migraines because we've seen positive benefits from people who are um, resistant to prescription medications for migraines. And for me, you know, I've the last thing in the world I would think of in the midst of a migraine is to mm -hmm. roll a joint and light it up. Um, but I listened, I listened to the doctor <laughs> and I gave it a try. And it changed my life. And for me, that was the moment when consuming cannabis went from something that was enjoyable and fully recreational to actually enabling me to live my life. Um, and it became more important to me in a different way than it ever had before. Mm hmm. Yeah. You know, migraines can be a, a debilitating disease or de debilitating condition. Um, you know, having to plan your day around, like, you know, not get, have, experiencing too much stress, you know, the triggers that, you know, that can bring on these migraines and not being able to, like you said, participate in family events and like work events. Um, so that's great that you found cannabis. And it's wonderful, too, that the doctor is the one that suggested it to you. Um, I love how more and more doctors are becoming more open minded to cannabis and, you know, recommending it to people. And there's many people nowadays that are benefiting from it, from that, those recommendations. That's wonderful. So um, you were, you discovered that, you know, cannabis was working well for you with migraines. And then how did you come to meet your husband and to found the farm? How did that all play out? So my husband and I met about maybe 10 years before we actually started Aster Farms. Um, we were living in New York together, uh, both cannabis consumers, but um, Sam had a little bit of a legacy behind his cannabis <laughs> interest. Sam's, uh, my husband, Sam, his grandfather was the first person to go to prison for cultivating cannabis in all of Mendocino. Wow. Um, and so, you know, his family was, they were part of the back to the land movement, um, turning over, uh, over lumbered mountains into to beautiful regenerative properties. And so, you know, we have taken a lot of the ethos from that, but it was certainly an inspiration for us, um, the, the path that Sam's family, not only his grandfather, his uncles, his parents, you know, it was a full family operation for decades and, um, and done the right way, done as stewards of the land, of people who care for their community, who care about the consumers that they're growing the product for. Um, so that was certainly an inspiration and really opened up the door for us to um, go to California, where the family business had been operating for over 50 years and start our legal operation. So um, that was, you know, really the connecting dots between the epiphany in terms of how important cannabis was medicinal side in our lives, and then also kind of this long, unbelievable legacy in the history of cannabis that um, we decided to carry forward. That's really cool. Oh, that's awesome. I didn't know that. And that's very interesting fact. So he's one of the true OGs of cannabis. <laughs> yes. And as you say, he and on International Women's Day, I would like to point out this is an actually a very interesting thing that we've been dealing with recently. There's a lot of misperception in the industry and with consumers in general that men happen to be the people who spearheaded and that this industry was built on. And while, you know, men were obviously part of that. Um, so so were women. And at Aster Farms, there was there were many incredible women who were behind the history of our legacy, um, from Ginny, Grant, Sam's grandmother, who was in the garden with Max, to Lynn, his uncle's girlfriend, who intercepted the DA and saved the family <laughs> operation, to his mother, who would trim and deal. You know, it was there were women behind this entire operation and behind cannabis, um, cannabis's entire history. And I think we need to talk about that more. And mm -hmm. at Aster, we are working hard to continue to shine light on that. 
I love that. And I love how you continue the tradition of the women in your husband's family that were involved in the farm, that you've become such an integral part of the of the business and the farm and, and leading the charge and all this. So that's really cool. And that's cool for it to come full circle like that. And thank you for mentioning that because you're right. There's many wonderful women cultivators and they really don't get enough spotlight. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. So from your perspective, this is a good segue. What do you think is really lacking in the cannabis space? Um, and so what, what did you decide to bring to the space with Aster Farms? And also, like, where did you get the name Aster Farms? I'm really interested in that. Yeah. So, you know, like I said, this there was this moment where cannabis changed in terms of my relationship to it. Um, we were also starting to hear other people in our lives have a shift in terms of their relationship to cannabis. Um, you know, my mom, who had definitely tried it before, but is not a regular consumer, was starting to ask all these questions about, you know, helpful for sleep and for her pain and this and that. And so the kind of curious world was really exploding at the same time that our relationship with the plant was strengthening in a new way. Um, and what we saw in the industry was that, you know, there are these ethos that we care about, right? We care about regenerative pra agricultural practices. We care about growing good product for people, um, for patients. And that, you you know, some we wanted to see that in the aesthetics of a brand um, that connected with the modern world and the consumers that um, that we are. And so, you know, we're conscious consumers. We care about what we put in our bodies. We care about, you know, the money we spend on certain companies. Um, we also live an active lifestyle. And so, you know, we didn't want to grow indoor weed for indoor consumption. We grew outdoor weed for engaging. <laughs> with your world, for going out under the sun, the moon, the stars, and, you know, socializing, being with people, being engaged, connecting to your world, connecting with yourself. Um, and so we wanted to create that brand and we didn't see that in the, in the cannabis space. Um, so, you know, the reason we called it Aster um, has a few pieces that all come together. Aster flowers um, are actually the largest species of flowering plants. So, you know, daisies, sunflowers, they're there are many flowers that we all know of and, you know, very common that are part of the aster species. And it's a really prolific uh, flowering species in that it typically flowers late. So it helps bees live longer, to, you know, it, it helps them have food longer into the season. Um, it is an incredible pollinating plant. It has really deep roots. So it's great for um, soil aeration and for erosion control. It's just a beautiful plant. And it's also the type of flower that you see in perfectly manicured lawns and also sticking out of the cracks of a sidewalk. And <laughs> that's the kind of brand that we are. We are everywhere in the cracks in between and also on the beautiful shelves. So and um, resilient is what I got from that too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and lastly, which comes full circle again, um, Sam and I asked her place in uh, New York was our subway stop for, you know, over a decade of our life together. And uh, we came up with the, the idea of creating Aster Farms in New York, uh, pretty close to the Aster subway stop. So it all comes together, our, our city world in Aster and the um, concept of these beautiful flowers. I love that. That is so cool. I love it. I love what you said first about how you're growing an outdoor plant for outdoor people to be out and engaging with the world. I, I love that. And I also love the whole story about your guys' farm um, and the name. So thank you for sharing that. I love those little, little, you know, little um, insights to people's brands. Um, so I know that's something that's really important to you guys is regenerative growing. Um, and the methods that you use at the farm. So can you tell us about that, why it's so important to the end point and to the quality and a little bit about regenerative farming, maybe for those who aren't aware of it yet? Absolutely. Um, so the concept, the basic concept of regenerative agriculture is creating a natural ecosystem on your farm. So creating an ecosystem in the soil with a full living microbiome, with fungus, with all of the things that actually do the work for you. Um, it's creating a system that could continue to regenerate itself where you're not taking more out of the soil than you're putting in um, and you're maintaining an equilibrium. And so we, um, we believe that not only is that the right way to grow cannabis in terms of being good stewards of this earth, but it also creates the best cannabis. And so at Aster Farms, we say we feed the soil because the soil 
soils feeding our plants. So we spend a lot of time nerding out on the soil, the insects, um, our cover crop, our companion crops, you know, the ways in which we go about pest prevention. And so growing outdoors, sun grown, we do grow, grow light deprivation as well. So we do light assisted. Um, but when we do that, we're growing in living soil beds that are open to the native soil. Um, so a couple of the top key points um, that I'll go through in regenerative farming are sun grown. Um, so sun is the best energy source. It also has the best light spectrum for growing cannabis plants. Living soil. So as I mentioned, that's creating a soil that's alive. Um, so a soil that has all the bugs and the creatures and the fungus and all those things that are creating nutrients, breaking things down aerating the soil naturally. Um, by not tilling, we are we are maintaining that living soil. Um, so you can think of tilling like the tractors that have the big blenders on the back. It's basically like blending your soil. You're killing the worms, you're killing all the microbiomes, you're disturbing that ecosystem. Um, so we use a technique called spading where we're kind of fluffing the soil in order to help aerate. And we use extensive cover crop systems in the winter. Um, so plants like daikon and mustard seed, which grow really beautiful tap roots into the soil and help aerate it completely naturally. Um, and lastly, organic inputs. So whether that's putting more inputs into the ground through a cover crop natural pr um, program, or that's through the actual additional additives that we're putting in, we're always using organic. We're always making sure that they're not affecting or offsetting something in this ecosystem, but rather helping maintain it. That's amazing. I've been really enjoying living soil products lately. I find that they have a higher terpene content. Would you agree with, with that? Absolutely. So what we found is, you know, a lot of times you'll see better shelf appeal when you're talking about an indoor or greenhouse grown product because it is literally undisturbed by the elements. Mm -hmm. But when you actually consume outdoor sun grown cannabis, you're getting a deeper, more complex cannabinoid profile and richer terpenes. And all of that contributes to the entourage effect, which gives you a deeper and more balanced high. And by more balanced, I don't mean you're not stoned. It just means you might, you're might you not getting to the point of paranoia. You're feeling it in a more radiant way in the ways that people have historically described the effects of cannabis. Um, so I am a daily heavy consumer and um, I will say that outdoor weed gets me a lot higher than indoor. I would say so too. And I actually just had the pleasure of being able to attend the Emerald um, Emerald Harvest Ball just recently. And I was so impressed with the outdoor flower. I was like, throw everything out the book that you'd heard about outdoor flower. It like blows everything away that I've even seen like indoor. It was just amazing. The terpene profiles, the beautiful buds, everything. So um, I love that you guys are really, you know, sharing your message and, you know, getting more people to experience your guys' flower. It's amazing. And you know what? And it's the genetics too. You know, yeah. when you talk about land race, some of these genetics have been built literally for the Mendocino climate, for the mm -hmm. Humboldt climate, for the Lake County climate, for Oregon, for Washington. And, you know, when you're talking about indoor, you're creating genetics for a cement room. Um, but when you're creating genetics for an actual climate, you are building the complexity and all of the aspects of that plant to thrive in the place that it's grown in a super unique setting. And so that brings out a lot of characteristics in the plant as well. And it allows us to really lean into some of those genetics that are some of the OG originals. That's amazing. That's cool. I love what you guys do and all the care you guys put into, into your product. That's amazing. I know that you guys also have a lot of social responsibility initiatives that I also, that's another thing I love about your company. Can you guys talk about some of those as well? Absolutely. So, you know, we care about, you know, when we say sustainability, sustainability is not just regenerative agriculture. And sustainability is not just using recyclable packaging. And, you know, all of those things are incredibly important, but it's also about community. It's also about your employees. It's also about social responsibility, um, because that makes a fully encompassing, uh, sustainable ecosystem. We're, we're not just one brand or one cultivator in a vacuum. We're part of a whole culture, a whole industry, a whole world. Um, so the organizations that we have partnered with, um, we 
we've worked with success centers for years now. They're an organization in San Francisco that we absolutely love. Um, they help with job training, with job placement. Um, they do fantastic seminars and educational programs for um, cannabis um, operators, for people interested in cannabis, for people interested in getting jobs in cannabis. Um, so we are huge supporters of them, really love everything that they are doing. Um, and um, so please check them out, um, support them as well. We are also part of a program called uh, Recompass, and essentially that enables um, medical patients, um, specifically women and LGBTQ patients, to be able to receive product um, for free. Um, so we just did an event um, with the Jane Project, I believe it was last week, and um, donated product to about 70 um, women in the LA area. So that is a fantastic program that gets um, product right to medical patients, which is in a really important piece mm -hmm. of this industry. And then we also partner with the Lake Merritt Institute, um, which is local to us in our Oakland HQ. Um, Lake Merritt is for anybody who's not in the Bay Area, it is um, a lake that comes out of the Bay and it has a lot of problems with pollution, both from um, coming in from the Bay and also just from the people traffic around the park. Um, so we work with them to clean up the lake and um, it's incredibly rewarding, really fun. And we will have lake cleanups in the future that we always invite anybody who's a fan of Astro Farms to join. So if you're in the Bay Area, look out. We will definitely be having one on Earth Day at Lake Merritt. So please um, look out and join us. We'd love to see you out there. That's awesome. I love all three of these programs that you guys participate in. And I will say also about the Recompass, the SB34 program that you guys participate in. I love that you guys are um, aiming that program towards women and towards transgender because a lot of the S a lot of the few programs that are in the state focus only on, mostly on veterans and on seriously ill patients. So there's not really that many that um, provide for that segment of the community. So I think that's really great. Um, and all three of them kind of filling different buckets. So um, that's wonderful. I love to hear that you guys are doing that. That's great. Um, so as a woman um, in the industry and as a leader, what's some of the, some advice that you would give to other women that want to enter the cannabis industry? So being a woman in the cannabis industry has been an interesting ride, I would say, <laughs> particularly coming from retail, which is heavily female focused in terms of the people in the career path um, and powerful women forging their way. Um, mm -hmm. Then going into the tech industry, which was relatively misogynistic <laughs> and um, had an interesting time there as a woman CEO. Now to be in cannabis, it's kind of like riding the entire wave of <laughs> um, gender careers in one industry in its short, nascent, um, you know, beginnings. When we all started in this industry, women in C-suite uh, and um, executive positions had there were more women in those positions in cannabis than any other industry in the United States. And in only about three or four years, um, the cannabis industry has dropped to below the national average in terms of women um, in leadership positions. So it's, um, which is very sad, um, particularly a comment on, um, you know, how we're seeing consolidation happen and who we're seeing um, be able to have the network and the resources and the access to be able to make it through the consolidation, consolidation and the volatility um, in the industry. And that um, typically it is uh, women and people of color who do not have those same resources and those same channels. So you are seeing the consolidation happen in very real ways and really kind of represent, unfortunately, what we see um, in in the larger um, scope of our culture. Yeah. Um, do you feel that as a woman-owned cannabis company that you have a different priority and that you operate differently than men than men owned male-owned companies? Well, I will tell a story about a trade show. Um, we, oh, there are many shows, stories about trade shows, actually, and I will not go to them all the time. Um, but at, and I will certainly not go to the MJ BizCon one, which I'm sure everybody knows about what happened at the last MJ BizCon. But um, at, at Hall of Flowers, which is a fantastic trade show we show at every time, um, the booth across from us at one of the most recent shows was... Um, centered around women's underwear 
it was cannabis being sold via women's underwear and very pornographic um, depictions on Polaroids and whatnot. And it was both disappointing and also this moment where I just felt proud to continue to be who we are and be wholesome and sell this product for what it is and not for, you know, sex value or any kind of gimmick that somebody's trying to slap on a Mylar bag. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, I do think, you know, for a couple reasons that there's a lot of responsibility as women in this industry um, to make sure that we're maintaining a positive image for cannabis, um, a positive image for women um, executives, and to also hold our place. And, you know, it's important that we stick together. Um, one thing that we've learned in cannabis, and this isn't just women, this is just being an operator in general in cannabis, the more you work together, um, the, the, the better you succeed the more you succeed and the better you can get through it all. So um, I think as women, we need to stick together and support each other. Um, and uh, there is a place for us and we need to continue to hold it. I love that. And I completely agree. You know, it's important to support and to prop each other up. Um, there's a lot of great women and organizations. Um, so wherever you live, you know, whether it's California or across the country, you know, really reach out and try to engage with those organizations, help other women, you know, prop them up, be a, you know, um, be a great support system for them and help, you know, share with other people the great work that they're doing and, and spread that message word of mouth. So I love that. <laughs> and, and, and look, you know, look, research the brands that you're buying. Um, it's important, you know, as a women run brand, as a small, a small business owner, um, every sale matters. And it matters what happens at the point of sale, what happens at that register informs the buyers. And when the buyers are informed, that affects your business. And so, um, you know, if you really want to support women in this business, look up the brands that are women owned and women run. Look up the dispensaries and the retailers and the operators who are women owned and women run and put your money behind them. I love that. That's a great point. Um, please do that. And there, the information is so easily and readily accessible nowadays. And a lot of times, too, the, the bud tender staff, um, they are really educated on the products and they could tell you, you know, if you want to buy something women owned, you ask them and they can point you in probably 12 different directions um, towards some great company that's doing something um, and supporting people that are doing great work. I love that. Um, what about what, what do you guys have, in com have coming up this year for Aster Farms? So we have a few things coming up. Um, first, I will say, which we didn't put on here, but we have recently done a refresh. So many people know us as Aster Farms. We are still Aster Farms, but we have refreshed our branding. So you will not see the farms um, on our packaging anymore, just Aster and beautiful nice. three colors representing our Sativa Hybrid and Indica today. Um, the things that we're really excited about. So we have expanded to the New York market. Um, it's where Aster was conceived yes. <laughs> over way too much sake in the East Village. Um, <laughs> and we are we are taking it back home. So we are excited to be launching in New York. Um, we will be also launching in the Arizona market in the near future. Um, we're super excited to finally be doing, make, making it mini, as our marketing um, team says. So making it mini, bringing out mini pre-rolls, um, which we believe is a fantastic skew, particularly for the New York market. And also building a creative content hub. So um, we, we are going to turn our New York farm into a place where we can have tours on the farm. We can have people there. We can create content. So really excited to build that out to the world of Aster that we've always been. That's really cool. So is your farm in New York actually like located like near the city or is it outside like an upstate New York? It is in upstate New York. Wonderful. That is really cool. Is there how many farms do they have operating currently in New York? About 200. Oh, wow. Okay. Wow. That's Which is very um, California. There, there were about four thousand licenses. I think in this last year, it may have uh, dropped significantly. Yeah. Um, but very big difference in how each state has gone about their licensing and um, how they're unrolling their regulations and their programs. Yeah, definitely. And that's why I was surprised too that two hundred had already made it through the system in New York. But that's great news, you know. I think compared to the four thousand, but um, that's a pretty decent start. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, that's great. So people that are watching from the East Coast, definitely look out for Aster products um, soon to be in the shelves in New York. That's really cool. 
Um, we have a couple questions from the audience. Um, do you have a couple moments to, to share with us? Absolutely. Awesome. Okay. And so we have one viewer who is saying, what would your first step be if you wanted to start farming? So, um, it, so I don't know if they're talking about, you know, personal or cultivation, but like maybe like a little take a stab at both, maybe just like real briefly. You got it. I would say whether regardless, whether you are starting with personal or commercial cultivation, start small. Yeah. Um, start by understanding the plant. A single cannabis plant can be incredibly difficult to manage when you are just learning about all the little things there are to go into it. Um, for example, once you see a pest, it is too late. When you see a pest, you have a problem. So you need to start understanding all the nuances, how to spot things ahead of time, how to understand why are the leaves curling up? Why are they drooping down? Why are they turning this color? You know, there are all of these things that are unique to a cannabis plant, but are also common across other um, farming and agricultural products. So um, just starting to get really uh, comfortable with that, I think, is the first step, whether you're going commercial or personal. That That is a really good tip. Yes, because if you can't master it with like one single plant, you know, you're just going to be wasting a lot of resources trying to take it in even larger kind of scale. Um, another person is saying that they had recently learned that um, hop latent viroid disease was spreading across the California market that some reports are saying as many as 40% of the crop has been infected. Can you talk a little bit about this, maybe like what it is and like what you're kind of seeing like in the Northern California region of growing? Absolutely. So um, as any agri agricultural product, there are viruses, there are all different kinds of um, problems that you can encounter. Um, yeah. What we're seeing in the California market is um, what is what would happen in any regulated market. Um, we have a limited number of nurseries that can actually produce clones that are allowed to produce seeds. Um, and it's it's um, a little bit of an echo chamber of uh, IPM or of viruses. So one thing goes wrong, it can spread quickly. Yeah. And um, that's what we've seen in California. We're also, again, in a nascent industry where we are learning things as they're happening about the plant. You know, when we talk to Sam's family about the operation in the 70s, they literally tell stories about, well, we learn to just grow the female plants. I mean, so, you know, in 50 years, we're going from just learning that you're just supposed to have female plants um, and not seeding everything to really uncovering new diseases and viruses and pest problems that are affecting cannabis. Um, it's really interesting to see the progression of the technology um, and the, the ability to kind of wash genetics and clean them. Um, so there are some great um, genetics providers who have solutions to that particular virus and who are on top of kind of what's progressing in cannabis genetics. Yeah. And from what I know about um, HPLVD, it's not something that is um, that has any negative effect on the consumer. It just affects the yields, correct? So Correct. And so when you're consuming product that comes from a legal market, um, all product that's that's sold at legal dispensaries goes through extensive yeah. testing. Um, it is not allowed to hit that dispensary unless it passes everything from microbial tests to um, heavy metal testing, pesticide testing. You know, we are held to pesticide regulations that vineyards would never be able to pass, that apples that you eat at the grocery store would never be able to pass. So we're we're held to incredibly high standards. The types of viruses, the types of IPM and pest problems we're talking about really affect yield. They're affecting potency. They're not affecting things that would actually hurt a consumer at all. All right. Thank you for clarifying that. And I think that that we just talked about something a lot of people don't know about. So I think that was really helpful. Um, we have another question. Um, Somebody is saying, what is a must have when you think about a place to start an outdoor farm? So that might be somebody's like backyard or if they have a big piece of property. What are some of the things that you think are the most important to consider when choosing a spot? Sun. 
You yes. want sunlight. <laughs> Cannabis is a sun intensive crop. Um, it's also a crop that is actually affected and um, grows based on light cycles. Um, so the reason that cannabis flips into its flowering mode is because of the change in the light cycle and the number of hours of sun. So it is sun is the most important variable you can have. Um, I would say the second piece of it is airflow. You want a dry climate. You do not want a lot of humility, uh, humidity. Um, cannabis can easily get moldy and can get powdery mildew. So you're looking for a really dry climate. Um, basically, the rule of thumb is where grapes are grown, you know, where you see vineyards, you can grow you can grow cannabis so um, look for vineyards and you know you've, you're in the right place I like that thank you again that's really helpful because we're about to enter you know spring planting season so I know a bunch of people are probably watching and going to take some of these tips to their home grows so that's amazing um, so if people want to learn more um, how can they get a hold of you guys you can find us on Instagram at, at Aster Farms. Um, we are active in our DMs, so hit us up. Um, you can also go to our website, asterfarms.com, where we have a contact page. You can download our sustainability report, which we do every year. Um, you can read about us. You can find our stockist there. Um, so please reach out. Um, and, you know, we are here. We love connecting with our consumers and fans. We love helping educate. Um, we love having having people at our farm. So um, be in touch, engage. Uh, we love our community. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, this has been so great. You're such a wonderful person. Thank you for giving your time to speak with us and educate us on what you guys are doing at your wonderful company. Um, definitely um, encourage everybody to reach out and check out your guys' website, learn more, learn about those three organizations that you guys talked about that are just wonderful. Um, Thank you, everybody, for watching and spending this International Women's Day. And thank you as well, Julia, for being with us today. Thank you so much. Happy International Women's Day to everybody. And um, hope this was interesting and that everybody learned somebody something. And please be in touch um, and help keep um, good operators and women-run businesses um, in business. I love that. If you do one thing or a couple things this month for Women International Women's Month or Women's Month and Women's History Month, definitely go to your dispensary and buy some women-owned products. Try Aster Farms and then tell your friends about how wonderful these products are and to also encourage them to buy them as well. And continue to buy them throughout the year and keep these farms and these families going. <laughs> um, I also want to thank your team. You, all, uh, you had several people that helped to make this webinar possible, so thank you to them. Also to Allison, who's one of your sales reps in Orange County she is amazing and I love her to pieces um, I hope that we were able to share some information with everybody that helps you become better informed cannabis consumers and that the information we help we shared will help you find relief until next time stay well stay safe and we'll see you for the next episode thank you bye Julie I'll send you an email okay Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.